Thank you all so much for being here with us tonight. Uh, I'm Molly Garfinkel. I'm the Managing Director of City Lore. And this is the first installment of Tell Me a Story, a City Lore Salon with Annie Lanzalato. For those of you who may not know City Lore, we are what I like to call a cultural advocacy not-for-profit. We were founded in 1985 with a mission to foster New York City and by extension America's living cultural heritage. We are and have for many, many years been based in the Lower East Side, but we really work across the city and across the nation. Um, primarily, we work in four cultural domains, urban folklore, uh, community history and conservation, arts education and grassroots poetry. And in all four of these, we really see ourselves as trying to model um, and create opportunities for a better world. We document, present, and advocate for grassroots cultures to ensure their living legacy in places, traditions, histories, and stories. And storytelling really is a significant part of what City Lore does. And we're very lucky uh, to have in our extended City Lore family, storytellers like Annie Lanzalato and Alvin Ng, uh, who will be presenting this evening. We're also thrilled to have as special guests who will also be joining us tonight, two longtime collaborators who are also part of the extended City Lore family, Ariel Estrada and Amy Chin. Now by way of introduction. Annie Lanzalato's first corner and mailbox to tell stories from was the corner of St. Raymond's Avenue in Zarega in the Bronx. The mailbox is still there. Annie is the author of four books and mem of memoir and poetry. During COVID-19, she became an avid still life painter of three lemons who were her sole company for weeks. Alvin Eng is a longtime city lorist. Tonight, he is thrilled to be joining Annie and everyone to share excerpts from his acoustic punk raconteur solo work in progress, Here Comes Johnny Yen Again, or How I Kicked Punk, created in collaboration with director and dramaturge Wendy Wasdahl. The work contrasts growing up in 1970s New York City during the punk rock heroin chic years with his own grandfather's opium overdose in Manhattan's Chinatown, all through the prism of William S. Burroughs' character, Johnny Yen. Many of you may also know Johnny Yen as immortalized in the Iggy Pop David Bowie song, Lust for Life. Tonight, Alvin becomes Johnny Yen again. Ariel Estrada is one of the collaborators on Racism is a Virus and Unapologetically Asian, as well as the Diversity and Inclusion Coordinator at Actors' Equity Association and the Communications and Membership Manager for the Consortium of Asian American Theaters and Artists. And Amy Chin is a cultural leader who has advanced the role of arts and culture in communities large and small for over 30 years. Also an experienced genealogist and researcher, Amy lectures and conducts workshops nationally and internationally. Amy's grandfather came to New York in 1903 and lived on Pell Street. After, after a childhood in her father's Chinese laundry in the Bronx and Sundays in Chinatown, Amy earned a degree in East Asian studies from Barnard College and speaks Tosanese, Cantonese, and Mandarin. Amy is also a beloved board member of City Lore. I want to take just a minute uh, to let you all know that after tonight's formal program, we'll be opening up the room so that you can tell us a story. Around 9 p.m., We'll stay live, but give you a chance to get a quick tea and grab a pen and piece of paper if you don't already have them, while Annie leads us in a brief action writing session. Then we'll invite those of you who would like to, to share a two minute story. If you're interested in doing so, you can let us know in the chat box and please feel free to drop in questions in the chat box as we go along with the program. And finally, we wanted to let you know that you should look ahead to our second installment of the City Lore Salon with Annie Lanzalato, Tell Me a Story, uh, which will take place on Thursday, October uh, 22nd, and details on that will be forthcoming. So now I want to turn it over to Annie Lanzalato. Annie, hey Annie. You got a catch for me? You got a throw for me? Yeah, I'm gonna, uh, hey, I'm gonna, uh, we're gonna play catch here on the corner, so I'm gonna ask you now to tell me a story, okay? Here's it over to you. That's easy, whoa! All right, I got it. Good throw, Molly. Who taught you to throw? Oh, wait a second. Molly, the, re the meter ran out. Oh, uh, you need a quarter? Yeah, I need a quarter. Okay, here. Hold on a second. Okay. All right, throw me a quarter. Okay, ready? Throw, throw. All right, I got it. Good throw. Tails. All right, I'll put a couple in because we, we need plenty of time tonight because I can't wait to talk to Alvin and Amy, and Ariel. All right. 
So I don't need to tell you, because I see who's in the audience tonight, but the country's in a nosedive. The presidential election is being delegitimized by the president of the United States. Now, <clears throat> there's many ways our votes might not be counted. Later, we're gonna talk about that. And we're also gonna talk about the implications of voting. So I wanna tell you a story. That's uh, what we're doing here tonight. In uh, 2016, in the last presidential election, I escorted my neighbor to the voting polls. She's an elder, she's got Alzheimer's, and she has a big faith, very religious. So we walked up the couple of blocks around the bend. There was a nice wind blowing. I always love when there's a wind on election day, especially a big election. And we walk into the grade school. Now, I think every time I've voted, it's been in a grade school. And I kind of wish it was in a place where my mind got into the adult brain. But once I walk into a grade school, it all hits me all at once. The brownies, the table with the donuts, the cupcakes, the rainbow sprinkles on the chocolate cupcakes, the pale blue and yellow wall of cinder block, the way my voice bounces off that cinder block, the echoes of the other people's voices, and the bulletin boards. I could still see the nuns slamming staple guns against the bulletin boards. Bulletin boards were prime real estate in grade school. And the nuns made them like altars, like ex voto symbols with gold trim and ribbons. The bulletin boards were always called for presentation. That was the word, presentation. As if all the kids' work was for show for somebody else. It was never about the howl of a child's soul. And when I was eight years old, I could have used a good howl. I still can. Can't you? So we walk into the gymnasium. Now in the gymnasium, I start feeling aggressive. And it all comes back to me, like aiming a dodgeball at some poor kid running away. And I remember this chant from basketball and the other sports too. Be aggressive. Do you remember this? Be aggressive. B-E-A-G-G-R-E-S-S-I-V-E. -E -S -S -E. Be aggressive. And I'm voting under the hoop. Now, as soon as I see a basketball hoop, my mind says, box them out, block them out. Elbows, your glutes, be strong, don't let anybody in. So this is the mentality I'm in as I pick up a paper ballot. Now, my neighbor with the Alzheimer's and the big religious faith, she says to me, Annie, I'm confused. Can you help me? I say, of course. So she said, please help me on the ballot. So I navigate the rows, the columns. I name every name she could possibly vote for, all her choices. And she says to me, where's Trump? All I want to know is where's Trump? Where's Trump? So I always believed voting was sacrosanct. So I point to the little hollow oval. And that oval is for the Oval Office. And I point, and as she puts her pencil in the middle of the oval, a little off center, I walk away, she says, thank you, and she fills it out. Now, my mother, first of all, my mother always took me to vote. I voted in every presidential election since 1964. What? Yeah, I was one years old, but my mother let me pull the levers. We voted for LBJ in 64, and in 68, Humphrey. I was five years old. My mother and I walked to the polls, we crossed Zuriga Avenue, not hand in hand, but pinky dinky, she called it. Holding pinkies. And we went in the voting booth, and it was magic. She let me pull the lever. <laughs> and the curtain closed behind us. I said, Ma, this feels so private. Why is it a big secret who you vote for? Like, what's going on? Does daddy know who you vote for? My mother looked more free in the voting booth than I'd ever seen her because we lived in a violent dictatorship under my father. He had post-traumatic stress from hand-to-hand -hand combat in World War II. 
And this was acted out in the kitchen and the basement and the garage and every other room. And my mother, what she voted for was against war, against killing. That's how she voted. And she taught me from three years old, this is very important. And who you vote for, for president of the United States, affects millions and millions of people that you're never even going to meet. You'll never know their names. But you have to think about them. And so it always stuck in my head whenever I vote for president. Who's this vote going to kill? That may seem like a heavy question. And today in the spirit of punk, because me and Alvin were both like punk kids, we love punk. It started to take a melody in my mind, you know. When you vote for the president of the United States, who's your vote gonna kill? Who's it gonna, who's it gonna, who's it gonna kill? Who's it gonna, who's it gonna, who's it gonna kill? Who's gonna, da -na -na -na. Now, in 2008, when I was in that voting booth, I felt like I was in the cockpit of a plane. And I felt like the lever was a rudder. So when I went to finalize my vote, I felt like we were all in cockpits and we were trying to raise the nose of the country to get the plane up, the wind under the wings to raise the whole country. Come on, let's fly America, get the nose up into the wind, get above that clouds up into this high part of the sky. Come on, let's fly, baby. And that night at 125th and uh, Lenox Avenue, thousands of people were out. Jim Bay drums were drumming, people were dancing. And one man had a big stars and stripes flag and he was running in circles around the intersection of 125th and Lenox. Outside that store called Lazarus, and it was in big letters, each a different color, L-A-Z-A-R-U-S. And I felt like the whole country had just been raised from the dead. So, you know, I, uh, sorry, I'm just a little hungry. I, uh, I wonder, well, you gotta excuse me. My blood sugar is dropping. I'm immunocompromised, I gotta eat. And um, I've been sheltering in place alone. And when I started, what, March 3rd being alone, I haven't been touched since March 3rd. So if I say something out of line, give me some elbow room. My friend Joanna mailed me 18 pounds of linguine from Campo Basso. It's got the good mountain air, the mountain wheat, the mountain water in it. So I'm eating linguine a hundred different ways. I'm eating it with pesto. And meanwhile, there's a grandmother who speaks Cantonese in Bensonhurst getting lit on fire by 13 year old boys. And what's happening to those 13 year old boys? Not much. Alvin told me a slap on the wrist. And I'm eating linguine because and I'm eating linguine with uh, bolognese when, you know, women are getting forced hysterectomies and uh, in detention and kids are being kept in cages on the border. Cages? Seriously? But I don't know what to do. I never felt so inert as a voter and sheltering in place. I can't go out in the streets. I don't know what to do. I'm counting on Ariel later to tell me what to do. And, um, We got to do something. And you know, in the spirit of punk, I don't know, we have to do it. So I'm going to pass the ball now to um, Alvin Eng, my pal, who's taking on a punk character called Johnny Yen. There he is, Alvin. You got your spoiled Dean, you ready? Yeah, I'm going to throw you the ball. You're going to tell me a story, Alvin. Tell your story. All right, here, I'm going to give you a nice high pop. All right, baby. Thank you for the throw and the great story. So I'm going to tell you a story now. I was working on the railroad. 
smoking way too much opium. I was the fall of a dynasty. A queer junkie's fantasy. I was a punk rock punchline. Repurposed as the jingle for a cruise line. I've lived over one billion lives. Died many more times. Never seen a sunrise. But you'll see my face in every sunset. Cause I was the all-American Chinaman who used to go by. Johnny Yen again. Johnny Yen again. This is opium. This is opium. In the West and through the ages, opium was distilled into heroin and sold on the streets with such names as junk, smack, horse, H, black pearl, black crystal, Chinese red, and China white. In the West and through the ages, OPM was also distilled, but sold in supermarkets, now online, and even at sporting events and concerts with such marketing monikers as Sesame Cracker Smackdown, Wasabi Pea Party, and of course, its franchise OPM brand name of Oriental Party Mix. This is processed junk. This is processed junk food. Back in the 20th century, it was often said that religion is the opiate of the masses. But now in the 21st century, have the masses become the opiate of religion? But what about the people of the opium? Before we can speak truth to power, we must first speak truth to powder. And yes, the Chinese supposedly invented opium powder, and yes, the Chinese supposedly invented gunpowder. But by all accounts, the invention of gunpowder was actually the botched byproduct of Chinese alchemists who were trying to create elixir of life via medicine. Kind of like Columbus discovering America while trying to forge new trade routes to the West Indies. Both had the same kind of impact on its own people whatever its own means anymore. Now we all know the impact of carnage that guns and gunpowder have wreaked on this planet. Lesser known or less discussed is the carnage that colonialism along with opium have had on this world. And it all goes back to those trade routes. Great Britain tried to expand its market share of China by dumping shipload after shipload after shipload of opium from its India colony on to China. China resisted. But back in the 19th century, Great Britain's defeat of China in the First Opium War was the biggest humiliation in Chinese history. It left China open to the West against her will. But it was almost like a war of the powder powers. And in the end, China's gunpowder was no match for Great Britain's opium powder. Still, as the late, great Leonard Cohen sings, there is a crack, a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. So even though opium and the opium wars completely destroyed China at that time, ironically, a decimated Qing dynasty that was too weak to control its own border and keep its people on the inside was the crack to which many Chinese escaped their extreme poverty and low status to come to America like my grandfather. My grandfather ultimately died of an opium overdose on the streets of New York City's Chinatown, but make no mistake about it. He was a casualty of the opium wars and you could never underestimate the impact of opium on China, the Chinese diaspora, but perhaps most profoundly on the Chinese psyche and soul. How that trickled down to my generation, 
growing up in 1970s New York City counterculture was punk rock. Back then, we Asian Americans didn't have many role models. Remember, this was before Aquafina, before Andrew Yang. So when I heard that Iggy Pop David Bowie song, Lost for Life, and its iconic opening line, here comes Johnny Yen again, I thought, Johnny Yen has to be a Chinese character. Turns out, while Iggy and Bowie made this amazing song, Johnny Yen was not their creation. They were paying homage to that singular icon of queer and junky literature, William S. Burroughs. Though by all accounts, Iggy really embellished the uh, Johnny side because Johnny was his drug dealer. Now Johnny Yen first appears in Burroughs' early 60s cut-up novels, most notably The Ticket That Exploded. And to me, Burroughs' conception of Johnny Yen is just that. The Yen, the need for drugs. The Yen, the need for sex. Basically, any time you feel the urge, the want to do something, to do someone. To say something, to be someone that may not be in your best long-term interest. Here comes Johnny Yen. Now, as a teenager, I could never fully grasp the junky side of Johnny Yen but I completely embraced the punk side. Punk rock became my opium. It was how I fit in, how I coped. Overnight, my entire wardrobe became black. All of my fingernails were painted black. And me and my best friend, Ray Wong, were the only members of the band who did not have to dye our hair black. I lived for punk rock defiance and in many ways still do the better and for worse. But that was then when life, when life was cheap and heroin was chic. Now don't get me wrong, nobody wanted to be an addict, but everybody wanted to live as if they were a 1970s New York City heroin chic junkie. To live as if you were a 1970s New York City heroin chic junkie, was akin to being a stone flaneur, a boulevardier. But rather than promenading up and down the Champs-Élysées, these 1970s New York City heroin chic junkies, they ruled the Bowery before it was shishi, when it was still funky but chic. Now you can follow funky all the way until it becomes chic, you can rule the Bowery to one day you're holding court in the Champs-Élysées. Chances are, you'll still wind up in that conundrum of an intersection between opium and OPM. At least that's where too many Chinese Americans wound up. Maybe that's why my grandfather, like so many Chinese in New York City in the early 20th century, they chose, consciously or subconsciously, to become permanent outsiders through opium. See, they never expected to be accepted here in these United States of America. Then there's also that tiny little legal obstacle known as the Chinese Exclusion Act. From 1882 to 1943, the Chinese Exclusion Act became the first and God help us last, American law that made it illegal for one race of people to become citizens here. But on another level, my grandfather accepted that these American means and laws would limit his neighborhood. He accepted that these American means and laws would limit his neighborhood. He accepted that these American means and laws would limit his manhood. But my grandfather also took a pledge to himself that these same American means and laws would never ever touch his soul. His soul was all his, floating in a cloud of opium, trying to survive on the inside while being completely disenfranchised on the outside. 
it's funny, powder has no edge. Yet it's what we humans take in every form to get that edge, any edge. For my grandfather, opium was his punk rock. It was how he coped. It was how he processed his station, how he processed his identity. Before there was Oriental party mix in these United States of America. Old Sakai, thank you. Annie, that was my story. All right, Alvin, Johnny Yen. What a pleasure to be with you, Alvin. Oh. Pleasure's mine. Thanks for having me. I love hearing your voice. I love your voice. Oh, thanks. We got so much to talk about. You know, you know what strikes me? You showed us your abacus from your family's laundry. Yes. And we're going to need it to count votes. I think that's what we have to go back to. Absolutely. You might have to do a workshop to teach us how to use those things. Well, that, that might be the most accurate way. I think so. Because now they're saying, you know, if you put the stamp on upside down, it won't be counted. If you put the envelope in backwards, it won't be counted. It's going to be disqualified 15 different ways. Oh, and this disenfranchisement is nothing new. It's been going on forever. So we got to fight even stronger, even stronger than ever. That's why I would, through the advocacy you're doing, that's such strong advocacy in your story. That was really wonderful. So Alvin, from, from the Chinese Exclusion Act to this spike, in bias and hate crimes against Asian Americans. Like what on, I don't know, what's on your heart tonight, you know, to educate me? Yeah, we, we're, we're, all, we're always, we've always been the, um, like a, a target of this. An easy outsider, like from, of course, the Chinese Exclusion Act, which gave us from the, uh, from, from all the, from the, uh, the gold rush and all, and everything else, and then opening laundries. And then, um, and then even on, on up to, on up to the into the nineties with the money money laundering. So it's it's uh there's always been something like China's always been an easy target. And now even with, with all the slurs which we want to amplify coming out off from the COVID, calling it the Chinese virus and, and much, much worse. And that's why it's a time it's a it's a time to call everyone. And that's why I'm so glad we were able to join be joined some of our friends tonight too. Right? So we'd like to Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to bring them in, but to bring in uh, Amy Chin and Ariel Estrada. Yeah, let's bring them in. That'd be great, because they're, they're on the front lines with all of us. All right, let's see. Let's see. Uh, Eva, you could help me beam them up. I'm going to see if I could find them. Oh. Hey, here he is. Teleportation always makes me dizzy. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hello, hello, hello. Hi. Hey. Hey. Hi. So, well, I guess we we can speak to the historical part and what's going on now. Like, like obviously, we're all on the front lines. Of, like, like um, area we were marching together at the They Can't Fire Us All rally after, yeah. the, after the defense center thing. And Amy, we're always doing advocacy things. Let's talk about, you know, how do you see this for us as where we are, like, as a line of the, uh, almost like the uh, institutional disenfranchisement that Chinese and Asians have always faced in this country and then how it's manifesting now? Well, first through. It's <laughs> coming straight from the very top, but being called, uh, uh, literally being um, attached to a virus <laughs> that has not, that really doesn't have anything to do with us. Uh, and, um, and just having that support from the very, very top is like creating, um, creating the atmosphere where people think it's okay to burn a 87 year old woman on the street, where it's okay to attack us or spit at us on the street. Um, you know, and from, from there, just building on to, you know, that's one of the things that we do with racism is a virus and with unapologetically Asian is just asking people to use their vote, use, use their power, that's later, uh, but use their power, use their voice to really, um, you know, work against those things to not be, or work against that um, societal conditioning that we should be silent, that we should be deferent that we are the quote unquote the model minority, which is a complete myth anyway. <laughs> complete myth because I'm nobody's model minority, that's for sure. Or at least I try not. Whatever happened to those kids? Did they get prosecuted or what was the. Uh... I'll, I'll, I'll be honest, perfectly honest, I don't think that they were prosecuted or were, if they are, they're, they're being, they're minors, so there's nothing really much they can do. They're not being tried as adults. Um, and at least, at least from our end, with racism and virus, and with many of the activists working who worked on that particular campaign, um, 
that you know they're 13 year old kids we, <laughs> we there's not much we want to do to them mm -hmm. uh however you know it, it shouldn't be i think that the work we did was super important in terms of again mobilizing the computing community getting them to use their voice knowing that it actually mattered um that it mattered and it actually moved things forward right well, and then we got if not punitive, what about educational for these kids, these boys? Yeah. I mean, this is, the, this is the thing I would love to be able to, because they're, again, because they're minors. Uh, somebody just asked in the chat what race, ethnicity, but the kids believe that they were white. Uh, if anybody can, can confirm that for me, that would be great. Um, they, they their were, identities weren't released, so we really yes, don't know their ethnic. Exactly. So there's, again, there's not much we can do in terms of education. We hope that their parents will. will well, I I think, I think education is, is, you know, goes beyond just saying, oh, teaching people is wrong now. I mean, I think we need to educate ourselves about the history. And, you know, I, I, I heard, I, we talk about this as being a spike in Asian American um, anti-Asian bias crimes, but, you know, it's hundreds of years, you know, and it just keeps happening. I mean, I, I do a lot of research and, you know, in thinking about tonight, um, I was thinking about how I, if you if you do a, a, a search in like Brooklyn Newsstand, which is a website that Brooklyn Public Library has of old newspapers, like, you know, you bring up all this stuff that is about racism against um, Chinese and about Asians. And I mean, like, it's funny because you have to um, you have to Google a term like celestial or Chinaman. <laughs> and like, you know, today I, I just did it right before the show. And like, there's this 1901 article where it says um, a mob of young and old Americans visited Chinatown last evening and proceeded to rough things um, in bad shape. Every plate glass window in the district was broken and every Chinaman was warned to keep indoors. Ugh. And then it tells about how, you know, this mob like grabs a Chinese man and pulls his cue out, like out of his head and waves it around. And so I'm thinking like, yeah, between that in 1901 and then the burning of this grandma now, nothing's changed. The only thing that's changed is that, you know, people hide it more, right? right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it, it wasn't even, it, it wasn't even as far as I know, like declared a hate crime, like it, 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 it <laughs> you know? So yeah. again, so so it's like uh, it's uh, individual and institutional in, in all in all those ways. But uh, but I but also you know, how we fight back. And I know we're all in the arts. How we fight back. And I feel like and I do a lot of work with the group called Rise and Resist also. And uh, and some people even wonder like in New York, you know, where where we're mostly like minded. I don't want to say all, but I think we we can never let any of this be uh, normalized and just always being on the streets it always says this is unacceptable this will not be normalized this will not be accepted so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And i know you're doing a, there's a lot of arts advocacy going on with, with uh efforts happening yeah yeah absolutely i mean I, you know it was it's so funny amy did we work together ever at the when i was at the alliance at asian american arts alliance i i'm sure we did I'm sure we did <laughs> <laughs> uh, i'm still wonderful friends with all those folks and i just i just spoke at their town hall uh, earlier this week about uh, ad arts advocacy and not, I'm sorry, not arts advocacy, but civic arts and civic engagement, mm -hmm. right? And I think, you know, we all work in the arts. We all know that when the arts are worth a damn, uh, they're already subversive, right? <laughs> it's yeah. just sort of naturally subversive anyway, um, you know, because we we're in the we're in the business of telling the truth, right? And the telling the truth is never. Um, is never popular among certain people, right? So, um, but with that in mind, right, we're also artists primarily, right? And I, one of the, a couple of the, the best practices that I shared at that particular um, talk for the Alliance was that, you know, there are so many people already doing this political advocacy work and they do it for a living. Uh, mm -hmm. And they would love to partner with us artists who don't do it for a living, who make art for a living, right? And are expressive for a living. Uh, and help them, right? I really um, just feel that the arts are a wonderful bridge um, that can cut, well, cut through the crap <laughs> and really get to sort of like the heart of the matter and the truth of the matter in ways that therapy doesn't, that even therapy or psych psychology doesn't do, right? Um, 
we're really good at being able to heal communities in that way through that truth telling and getting people to um, express things that they would never express to a therapist or express, express to a psychologist. Um, similarly, I think we, we can fill the gaps in uh, political work as well and getting people to sort of are winning hearts and minds, convincing them to vote <laughs> and how important it is, uh, especially now. Mm -hmm. um, and getting them to, to really be sort of get in touch with their passion about the issues and that does matter to them and it does matter to their communities and will affect their communities to use their voice and get yeah. involved. That's, thank you, Ariel. Um, someone said, uh, Professor Amy Ross said, what's the correlation between storytelling and voting? And I think you just addressed that. And, um, you know, in terms of healing and story and, and history, mm -hmm. you know, uh, what Amy said, you know, stories. Alvin's talking about his grandfather. Alvin, I want to hear a lot more about your grandfather. So we're going to have to. Right. Well, so, so, storytelling is advocacy and, and storytelling. Stories are witness. They are, wit they are witness. witness. They are witness. Really through too. That's, that's I'm writing that in the chat. What, um, what <laughs> message should I put in the chat? What, um, will, will you, Amy and Ariel, tell me? Uh, what should we put in the chat? You know, some hashtags for people to look up to find your work and what's Oh, oh I'll, I'll, put, I'll type some in right now. Uh, this is a great new world. We can cut <laughs> uh, uh, well, well, Ariel's doing that. Amy, um, tell us a story. Oh. Yeah. Um, let me think. Okay. I, at the very start of this pandemic, this was in March, you know, the pandemic here. Um, you know, I walked out of my building and I'm going down the street, you know, and I'm thinking about, you know, how, how this is going to affect us. And I think the full breadth of it, nobody knew any yet. Um, and a car drives by and the windows roll down and somebody yells out, you Chinese are fucking disgusting. Oh, can I say this? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Say it again. <laughs> That's right. It's not network TV. It's fine, right? Um, and and, and it, it shocked me. It really shocked me because, you know, growing up in New York and in the Bronx, you know, you heard stuff like that all the time, mm -hmm. you know, and you just kind of let it roll off you. Um, and, and, you know, but it really stunned me because it hadn't happened in a really long time. And my cousin talks about this a lot. I mean, she's very accomplished in a very mainstream way, like works in corporations. And she says, you know, it doesn't matter how high you go up in the executive chain, somebody's going to cut you down with something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's funny, you know, in right now with Facebook, I posted it up on Facebook. I said, oh my gosh, I can't believe I walked down my street and this happened to me. Mm -hmm. And then there's this whole outpouring from a lot of my largely middle-class white friends um, who are shocked, they're stunned. They couldn't believe that that would be happening. And it was, it was a real um, surprise to me in some ways because I realized that it wasn't in the realm of their experience. Mm. But for me and a lot of my Asian American friends, you know, we experience it and it's in our minds every minute, every second, every day, every year. Um, and, uh, uh, in, 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 the, in the, to paraphrase, paraphrase Alvin, like, here it comes again, <laughs> here comes racism again. <laughs> and like, it's open season on, on all immigrants now, like Annie and I were talking about that now too. It's like, uh, it, I, just when you think we were hopefully expanding the uh, definition of what it means to be an American as we have to, all of a sudden it's like, whoa, what's, uh. You know, like uh, what it means to be an American, it's, it's still trying to be narrow casted again. So. Yeah. And what, what I think is great, Alvin, when I listen to your pieces, is that you're telling your story, you're telling our story. And how it, it reminds of how important it is to get our stories told and to make sure that it's your story to tell mm -hmm. and that other people tell that story too, but tell it in the right way. And you just do it in such the right way, Alvin. <laughs> no, I'm just, those oh, are incredible, Alvin. Those are, it's gorgeous, really gorgeous. Yeah. Ariel, you want to tell us a story? Sure. Um, well, I, I think it's just bits and pieces from my own solo show that I'm working on, 
which actually draws on a lot of, of Filipino history, you know, that we're talking about history and about the power of how um, knowing about history and how storytelling, again, can like provide um, historical context about we have been down this road before, right? Amy, when you when you said that you're, that some of your white friends were just so shocked, same, same experience, same experience here, so they so shocked, like they had never, they don't see it. They don't see it. They don't, um, like, you know, I grew up with knowing that the Filipinos were slaves in this country, along with black people, right? That we were brought over as slaves by the, by the Spanish, uh, mostly on the West Coast, right? Nobody knows that. Nobody knows that a million Filipinos died, literally, uh, piles of bodies on the beach during the Filipino-American War, because, uh, which was in around 1901, 1908, excuse me. Um, and, oh, sorry. Yeah, 1897, right after, right after the Spanish-American War, uh, because Americans came to the Filipinos and said, "Hey, we'll help you liberate, we'll help liberate you from the Spanish," and they were like, "Great!" Um, and now we're taking you over. <laughs> and when we tried to fight back, they literally killed a million of us on the beach, um, literally shooting at us. Uh, and we, they were, we were attacking with auto knives and yo-yos. We invented the yo yo by the way. People don't know that. Um, polo knives and yo-yos and we were just getting shot down by guns and literally from the American boats just shooting at us there. Um, you know, so the thought of, of Asian American violence um, being this sort of new phenomenon, you're exactly, exactly right. It's not, never not been new. It's always been around, right? And because of sort of the nature of how uh, anti-Asian racism or it works here, Right, we've been taught, we've been positioned against uh, against our other our brothers and sisters of color and other and other BIPOC communities as being this model minority. Look how look at how great uh, uh, look at what can happen if you just sort of play by the rules and obey white people. Uh, and it's so not true. Um, you know, you can even see it now. I mean, there's it's so called like the Asian American or the Asian Hate Crimes Task Force. It just happened. It's now permanent. Um, it's really problematic um, because it such a thing is a perfect position to um, be wedged against other people of color again, primarily from Black and Brown communities. So, you know, none of this is new. And I think about my father's story of when he first came here, um, and he had never seen the state before. He was like a young man. He was 32, 31, 32. He, he decided to when he got his his orders. Uh, he joined, he was able to come to America because there was a, a program where the Coast Guard, if you joined the military, um, you could uh, become an American citizen. So he joined, he originally joined the Air Force, and then after his um, best friend was killed in this horrible, horrible accident on their carrier, uh, and he was ordered by his um, commanding officer to pick up his friend's pieces and put it into a bucket. Um, yeah, that was bad. Uh, he decided to join the Coast Guard instead. And then when he decided, when he got his first orders to report to uh, Northwest Virginia, uh, to Coast Guard base there, he decided to go across the country in by bus, um, partly because he couldn't afford a car. And he wrote, wrote the button as he was going across the country, he began to notice like all the segregation signs. And it was the first time he'd ever been, sort of been, he'd ever been, um, uh, ever been exposed to that. And he used to play a game actually at the water fountains uh, <laughs> because it would, there would be water fountains for white and black, right? Or white and, um, and since there were no signs for Asian, he wasn't sure which where, one, where to go to, right? And of course he grew up in the Philippines. He'd never really sort of encountered this sort of kind of racism before. So he didn't really, he was very confused. Um, but then he, quickly learned. <laughs> um, by the time he got to... What did he do, Ariel, with the water fountains and the buses? And, well, and then once he got to, to Virginia, he got to the, to the, to the base, uh, and he still had to take one more bus ride. And this was the dead of winter in Virginia, with six feet of snow on the ground. And he came to uh, the bus driver, let him off, uh, just said, uh, sit in the back of the bus, boy, when he got into the bus, and he was like, oh, shit. Yeah, now I know where I stand in this country. 
And then, um, then the bus driver let him off about a mile away from the, from the uh, Coast Guard station. Uh, and he was carrying this full rucksack on his back. And he said, get out here, boy. Uh, and he had to walk an entire mile mm -hmm. in the snow and still in sort of in not really winter clothes because he was out in California first uh, to the Coast Guard base. Mm -hmm. That was his first, one of his first encounters with America. Wow. Why don't you, um, Ariel, what was his name? Why don't we name the, uh, name our ancestors, Alvin and your uh, grandfather's name. And... Rogelio Torres Estvara was my father's name. All right. And Hello. Alvin, what, what about your grandfather? It's, 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 uh, they, you know, as we know, we, we all, Amy is, knows us, we, we all had changeable names, right? That was to, to circumvent the Chinese Exclusion Act. So from what I could tell is, um, his name was, a uh, Fu Jie Chin. That was the name of our, of our laundries, even though we're Ang. That's, that's part two. That's part two. Of the <laughs> Listen, there's some questions in the chat. Um, Amy, one for you about 70 Mulberry Street. Tell, tell us from, uh, tell us from the get-go what's going on. What's 70 Mulberry Street? Well, 70 Mulberry Street is um, this old school building, PS23. It actually is like the very first modern public school um, in New York City. And there was a horrendous fire uh, around Chinese New Year. And um, a lot of these wonderful community groups in Chinatown were made homeless by this fire. And right now there is a, a, um, a fight to preserve it. Um, there are forces in the neighborhood that want to knock it down and they've already torn half of it down and some people in the community want to build a 20-story high-rise there um, and uh, other forces um, want to preserve uh, and rebuild the historic exterior and get these groups back into their home as quickly as possible. One of the real tragedies um, of this fire is that the Museum of Chinese in the Americas had their museum archives in there, and they were severely damaged. Um, and uh, right now what we're looking at is that the, we don't know what real estate interests are at play right now that want to um, turn this into some kind of modern structure in the heart of um, historic Chinatown. Mm -hmm. so. And just New Yorkers, we're fighting this with a double barrel like that. That fire happened on Lunar New Year's Eve and then obviously we all know what happened last uh, last Friday, the first night of a Rosh Hashanah. We, we, we lost, you know, we, 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 we lost the great justice. So it's uh, like, if you have, I feel like here in New York, we have an even heavier burden to fight, you know, but we will do this. Uh, Annie, how do we lift our burdens here? You know everything, please. <laughs> no, um, let me see. Uh, let's see, there's, let's take one more question. Uh, Catherine Lee says, important point that you made, Asian Americans are often seen as the wedge keeping black and brown communities from advancing. Uh, it's not really a question, but I don't know if you wanna, I guess you already talked about that. Let's see. Oh, I, do, I do see she's on the other end of anti-Asian racism or stereotypes of Asians that are linked to success, especially in tech. Does the negative get fed or countered by the positive? I mean, first, it is definitely a, a stereotype. Um, and that actually, in, in the Asians are uh, comprise some of the fastest growing uh, poverty level in this country, right? The, the what was, and I can't remember the statistics right now, I'm so sorry. But they- Hello to Ariel, I'm having a hard time hearing you. Oh, so sorry, it's the fact, the, the Asians are the fastest growing um, poverty group in this, in the country. Poverty uh, down, impoverished? Poverty, yep. In, they're impoverished and living, living below poverty level, right? So that is one of the functions of that particular stereotype is that we're all successful and look how hard we work, right? And it gets to the, it's great, it's a great way to ignore the fact that we are, that we're actually really struggling and really poor and the majority of us are working class, right? We're just like every immigrant community here, right? We, you know, we, we're doing what we need to do to, to you know, support our families. And, you know, and, and yes, I mean, there are, because of, of Asian proximity to, to whiteness, right? There is, there are some communities that are successful, right? But again, that's a function of white supremacy, right? It's give, hand out a few more cookies to the minority folks 
and try to fit them against each other. <laughs> right. yeah. And Ariel and Amy, can you put in the chat just ways people could find you in social media or something, ways if people want to, you know, and, and lastly, with voting coming up, how do we ensure votes are counted? What do you, like, what do you, Ariel, what do you suggest? I know you guys have been out in the streets. I see those comments. Alvin, you were in Philly in the last election. Is that, is that right? Yeah, oh, uh, actually, sadly, two, two, two elections ago, and um, it was so great. We walked, you know, uh, Pennsylvania is always a swing state, but I walked into to the, the volunteer room, and I knew half the room. There were all these New Yorkers down there in Philadelphia canvassing. And so on. Now, with, with uh, you know, with sheltering in place, what activism are you, what, what should we do? Mm -hmm. What can I do? Well, Ooh, wow. <laughs> and tell stories. What else can I do? Uh, I'm, I'm doing some phone banking with equity, actually. Uh, that's my other, uh, every Thursday until the election, um, after equity, if you're a member of after equity, we're doing- I am, I am a member. Hey, uh, we're doing phone banking every Thursday. And they actually, and equity actually just came out and, and endorsed uh, Biden parents, uh, which I think is fantastic. Ah, you're doing postcards. Lots of, lots of postcarding through Reclaim Our Vote, lots of postcarding. Uh, but I, sadly, we're so close now that a lot of the postcarding is winding down. But there's ways just to make sure to let people know that so their votes are counted, that they are still on the voter uh, rolls. And also Reclaim Our Vote, there's many groups, Reclaim Our Vote. They were so organized helping us reach people who might be disenfranchised, make sure their vote counts, make sure they're still registered. And also they're having webinars about how to transition to phone banking now too and there's so many great organizations stacy abrams has a and has fair play of course uh are still our first lady michelle obama when we all vote there are all these great groups just ways to get out the vote and make sure the votes are counted and that they are not they are on the rolls there's so much disenfranchisement going on mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, you know, as a great way to wrap up this segment i see again professor amy ross Remember, telling stories is so important because it's a form of resistance against the lies. Here, here. Uh, we gotta, we gotta put that on some kind of, some kind of shirt. And Ariel, what does your shirt say? I want to see. Oh, the whole <laughs> it's a joke. It's kind of a joke shirt. Abs are great, but have you tried lechon kawali? <laughs> lechon kawali is like the fattiest Filipino dish you can possibly eat. It's basically a pig. When I come out of sheltering in place, we'll go out and eat that. Um, it's basically a pig and you just throw it in oil and let it fry until it's crispy. <laughs> so listen, I, I'm so thrilled to meet you both, really, and Alvin, just to hang out with you. And let me just tell you what's going to happen now. We are going to, let's say, finish, call this a finish of the uh, performance, so to speak. And then we're gonna move into the audience participatory city law stoop corner stories, like what's your story? So we are gonna, I'm gonna beam Ariel and Amy back to the audience. You're gonna get beamed down. Thank you, Ariel. Thank you, Amy. So put on your seatbelt. Put Great on your seatbelt. See you again. It may Thank take you. And um, everyone, you can get in touch with them if you wanna go hit the pavement with them. And uh, I'm gonna write. I call it action writing. Eva behind the scenes is gonna play some loud punk music. And I want you all to write with me. That means get a notebook, get a pen, and your prompt is everything you heard. You just heard it all. Now it's your chance. And then we're gonna beam up a few people one at a time. Drop your name in the chat if you wanna be beamed up to be visual and to be heard, to be seen and heard to tell a story. Two minutes, a minute, two minutes, that's it. If you go longer, we're gonna beam you right down, so don't make me do that. All right, so I'm gonna start writing. Eva's gonna play the music, and you could go get a cup of tea or whatever and come back or watch me write and write with me, and then we'll have story circle. Drop your name in the chat if you wanna be beamed up. All right, Alvin, I want you to write too. Writing time, we'll see you all in a few minutes. Before we go again, thank you everyone at City Law. Thank you, Annie, for having us too. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Molly. Thank you, Eva. Thank you, everybody. And Annie, thank you for bringing us together. Now it's time to write. Everyone, do the right thing. Okay, see you Put the music, Eva. Attending
came round with a shot of tap water and a blue pill. Watch me swallow, turn to walk away, I can see her still. I spun around, spit into the ground, walk the flights down to the basement. Okay, who wants to come tell us a story? Come on, who wants to be beamed up? Nobody's put their name in the chat. All right, then we're gonna have to keep telling stories. Wait, what about Sally Mae? Don't you wanna come on in? Our humanity will not be broken. Rosemary, you know, I'm here. Uh, no, I'm I, my picture here, I, I don't know how that, that works. All right. Um, Wait a second, Sally, hold on. So let's see. Promote to panelists. Hi, Sally. Sally, can you um, un, uh, allow us to see your camera? Here it comes. All uh, right. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, wait a minute. Right. See if I can turn on, hang on. And next up we have Tita. All right, Tita, get ready. I didn't put, I didn't put my lipstick on. This is a, this is a travesty. And Juju's after All right. Tita. All right, we got one, two, three. We got Sally. Then Tita, Sally. Let me put on the lipstick. Let me put on the lipstick. Put on your lipstick, Tita and Juju. <laughs> That's the lineup. All right. You're calling me out, Annie. Well, you know, this is a phenomenal night. Mm. It's a phenomenal night. Thank you for Tell this. Tell us a story. We don't need praise. We want a story. Wait a minute. You're bossing me around again. I've had 30 years of bossing. I said, I haven't been touched in six months. <laughs> I'm not and I'm like, well, hey. I know both of you and Alvin, that was such a treat. Oh, um, you know, I didn't have a story ready because I feel, you know, this is such a time where I feel like I, I'm just getting knocked in the head about, you know, what I haven't realized all these, my whole life. Mm -hmm. You know, I was on my bike realizing today, uh, well, you know, the story about the 89 getting burned, the 89 year old grandmother getting burned up just like sort of took over my brain. Yes. You know, I've been Googling her like, what happened? You know, and I, I work in psychiatry and what I will say is I go to so many of these places, I, 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 I do, um, go into the community and do like a psychiatric assessment and everybody's falling apart. And there used to be so much more. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I've just really moved by all the these stories about Chinatown and I go to Chinatown a lot. And I really, you know, I, I don't have a translator coming with me and we do a phone and we used to have a resource where we could get somebody from the community to come with us that ended. And, um, you know, it just, it's so important. And now everything is amped up, amped up, amped up. Mm -hmm. And people are falling apart and getting anxious and, you know. What are you seeing in psych when you say people are falling apart? What's, 
What's amped up in terms of site emergencies? Well, whatever they have is times 100 now. So, you know, we're seeing, it used to be we would see people that, you know, they never take medication. They've had a long history of being in the hospital, but now it's everybody. Now it's everybody. Now we're going to fancy buildings and somebody has OCD like, oh my God, I touched something and now I know it's camp contaminated and I can't handle it. And I'm begging you, but I'm begging you, I'm begging you, I'm begging you, please don't take me to the hospital. I'll follow it, you know, yeah. and just. Sally, I have a question for you. Yeah. You know the DSM. What does that stand for, the DSM? Diagnostic Statistical Manual, I think. I yeah. don't even know. You're exactly yeah. right. And, and that's for psychiatric disorders descriptions. Yeah, that's right. Okay, now we know things come in and out of the DSM. Homosexuality was in it for God knows how many decades. Mm -hmm. I feel this voting mania should be in the DSM. I don't have a name for it, but I feel people are getting, there's no logic. I feel what happened to the logic in I have my candidate, you have yours, and here's my seven reasons. Why are people at each other's throats and it's a mob mentality where people have fear to put in their window who they're voting for because of fear of being attacked. People are getting attacked. What is this manic voting tribal? What part of the brain? <laughs> now you're that's asking me to be a psychiatrist. Well, that's um, what I'm asking you. What that I don't know. All I can tell you is people are falling apart. We're going in there and we're seeing people across all socioeconomic uh walks of life all cultures everywhere that they are just having a hard time and i'm going in there and saying does this person need to be in the hospital what would that do i don't know um the voting thing you know i'm seeing a lot of trump people out there i'll tell you that as well you know and the old older people that are, you know, not wanting anybody to come into their home because they're worried what's going to happen and I'm going to lose everything. People are worried they're going to lose everything and they're going to lose their ability to be independent and survive. Ooh. I mean, that really is so much of what... That's, t that's a tight nutshell you just described, you know? That's really, that's a tight spot. But I, I just have to say how much it was to get into Chinese culture tonight and, you know, Amy Chen and Estrada and Alvin, I've known you so many years and to really have you pound that out, it was just transcendent. It just, uh, you know, I, I really felt, uh, I've always loved you, but I felt so close to you tonight. Oh no, thank you. So good to see you. you know, we're talking to Andy about that. We were we were honored to be part of the this is what we were just trying to create, recreate an, an avant-garde rama here too. Uh, well, we gotta <laughs> still do it. We gotta reclaim the avant-garde rama because it ain't happening at PS122. I mean PSNY. <laughs> but um, we're gonna keep it going and you're you're part of it always. Sally, well, why thank, thank, oh, thank you. So good to see you. Thank you for being here and, and always Talk about uh, all about promoting stories. She's always been a, a great, great promoter of stories. So thank you, Sally. Thank you. No, no, we don't no, leave. No. Don't go nowhere. Stay on the panel. Here's I'm Tita. here. Woo! Uh, great player, uh, Tita. All right, tell no. us how to say your name and tell us a story. Tita. Tita. Um, last year, my friend is walking down Broadway a few days before Halloween, about 7.30 at night. Suddenly a group of young boys, about 12, rush toward her laughing, throw a water balloon at her forehead, oh. hard. Sticky fluid bursts on her, not water. Oh. She runs after them. An older woman says, they didn't do it. A detective comes out of the air and takes over then later without telling anyone drops the charges. Oh. My friend has to go to the hospital, hours of examinations because she has a concussion. Oh. She has to call friends to help her get home severe headaches, told by doctors to stop reading, looking at computer screens or TV for weeks. Her life suspended, except for calling the detective who never returns calls. Mm -hmm. Paperwork that has changed her charges. When she can walk, she goes to the police station to speak directly to the detective. 
All she wants is to speak to the parents, explain why the boys need to know that even if they think they're having fun, they could have killed another human being. Mm. They caused her severe pain. She wants them to know. Mm. The detectives and the parents are desperately trying to keep the boys from getting records. She tries to say she does not want to press charges, just explain to their parents what the boys need to understand. They tell her to go home with empty reassurances. Mm. The Spanish American and African American detectives do not let her speak with the parents. She is Chinese American, the boys are African American. Mm. Mm. That's it. Wow. How'd your friend Thank now, you. Tita? How, um, what was in the balloon? What was the fluid? Nobody ever tested it. She tried to get it tested. They, they wouldn't. She's okay now, but. Yeah, violence and violence against women. You know, in Italy, there's a word for violence against women that's very popular. It's called feminicidio, which is like feminicide, but we don't use it. It's really the killing of women. Mm. And there's posters of thousands of women all over Italy, wherever mm. you go in the cities, you'll see on walls. And uh, why is it okay to, why is it okay to kill women? That's, a, that's another big question, I guess. She wanted to tell the parents, why is it okay to think you're having fun and do something that could hurt mm. you? All right, I'm going I'm to bring in Juju. Black. I'm going to add Juju to this circle and you two stay here. You're very, I love that you came in. Uh, let's see, Eva, if you could help me promote Juju, I'm looking for her name. Where'd she go? Let's see. It's hard, Sally, to do all this Zoom magic and everything. I can't do it. Don't ask me to. I'm looking for <laughs> Juju. I want you to do your video. You don't have to. Do you want to do your video or no? Yeah, do the video. Come on, Amy, put the video on. <laughs> Where's that hey, beautiful Juju? All yeah, right, right. I pulled her on. Both of us are here. Jojo! Yay! Yay! Oh my God, <laughs> oh my hair. Well. <clears throat> Let me see well, that lawyer, that lawyer that you have next to you. You always have your lawyer with you now. Let me see, where is she? Come on, lawyer, let me see. Oh, you. Do. Come on, huh? get in there, see you. Oh, 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 hello. Hi. Hi. Hi, Amy. Amy. <laughs> All right, Amy, introduce both of you. Come on, Juju. Tell us okay. both of right. <clears throat> I'm Juju, and that's, that was my daughter, Amy. Well, I don't have a story to tell, but as you know, <clears throat> I have a, I've been working in the Asian American community for a long time, since the uh, 1980s. I think, um, as you are aware, the Asian Asian American community was really not an organized community, so to speak. So <clears throat> until Vincent Chen murder happened, then the community started to come together. In 1990s, I think finally we all realized it's really important we build some kind of a collective voice to speak up and speak for our community are important issues. So <clears throat> at one point, all the different organizations from the community came together, organized this thing called the uh, National Asian Pacific American um, Coalition or something. So mm -hmm. we started to have some, and that was recognized, yeah. you know, in the, in, by the White House. And uh, <clears throat> they started having some kind of a small voice Still, you know, the Asian Asian American community is really a developing community. So you have people coming in since the 1960s until, and of course prior to that, but since it started growing rapidly since 1960s until now, it's still new immigrants are coming in every day. So, well, not nowadays, but, um, all these people arriving at different time have a different priority, a different agenda. So I am really concerned <clears throat> that in the Asian American community, the consciousness really needs to be raised. And because everybody's in a different place, some are new from China, they, their heads are in a different place, others are struggling for, to make a living, and others are struggling with the language 
And uh, <clears throat> so I think the arts community, it is so, it, I think uh, you, you guys can play a very, very important role mm -hmm. in, the, in, the, in our community by raising consciousness. And I think it's, a, it's a mu getting to be mu a much more encouraged nowadays with the younger people like Alvin and uh, this generation, the American born Asians, and the, the many, many of them are very active. We are just, you know, I think we're very encouraged by the <clears throat> Black, Black Lives Matter movement happening recently. And hopefully the Asian American community can get there. Even though we're, you know, right now we're collaborating with uh, the Asian Black Lives uh, Matters, but I think we need to build a much, much stronger voice. Don't you think? Yeah. What do you think, Alvin? <laughs> How about you being the other Chinese? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you two are meeting because, you know, that's so great. Juju's in Chicago, Alvin. Oh, great, great. No, there, it's, it's a better lighting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm in Chicago. We, we, we know about Chicago as in convention, but uh, I think, you know, the new generation, they, they, are, they are prepared to speak out, too. Yeah. Yeah, yes. They, they, don't, they, don't, they don't feel the stigma that, that, uh, that, that we felt. And, and, and the numbers are there. And it's just, uh, uh, if, if anything you know, good is coming out of it, people know that they don't have an option, that they have to speak out. Mm -hmm. Like, this generation is so much more politicized. Oh. School shootings, got all these things yeah. going on. So I, I think the young, young generation, already, like a, like a, the area over here, like area, we 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 were the uh, we were the older folks that they, they in response to the eighty nine year old woman uh, getting burned, there, there were these rallies saying, uh, you know, they can't burn us all. We started oh, in uh, wow. Washington Square Park and we went down to Chinatown, and uh, you know, so so uh, no, they 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 really are feeling it, and, and I just think uh, it all grows. Like uh, I think. What was so great about BLM this summer, Black Lives Matter, that it was it was finally uh, you know um, every every race was out there, you know, yeah. and, and I just think you know no no one's no one no one stays no one just stays in, in their uh, in their lanes anymore when it comes to this. Yeah. Like even at our protest too, there were many different uh, types of people too. So I, I just think now you know activism. Most people now activism is not an option. So no so so. Um, Juju, I think we you know they're 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 pick, picking that up, and we and we need help from like your lawyer too. Your lawyer is going to help us get it. Yeah, where's that lawyer? What is what is she what is she working on? That lawyer, Amy, well, tell us about Amy. Your tell. Work. Come on, we want both generations. She, she wants you. To... <laughs> she wants I have you. nothing to say. <laughs> well, what are you, know, you working hey? on? Tell us what you're working on. Um. Well. I'm working on jail decarceration. So I'm working on criminal justice reform, but um, really on not so much defunding the police, but sort of taking the money out of the justice system and investing into communities and mm -hmm. services people need. Um, like what? Like, uh, what are some of those? Explain to people, what, where, where would those funds go in a helpful way? Well, I don't think it's the same every place. I think the communities have to say um, where they think those resources are needed. Um, it's different everywhere, but definitely, you know, there's a lot of need for investment in mental health treatment, um, housing. I mean, housing is number one all the time. Um, you know, it's just, it's like poverty and systemic disinvestment from communities of color really uh, everywhere. So um, yeah, so I'm working on that, trying to, to reduce our reliance, over-reliance on jails um, and not prisons, but jails, um, which is, you know, well, people are still innocent. They end up in jail and just sort of waiting, uh, awaiting trial. So that's what I'm focusing on. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Yes, and and I think like maybe with Sally Naked asked this too. Like emergency response should obviously not only be police. A lot of times there's there are right. emergencies that That's are, exactly right because police don't know how to handle it. They yeah. they don't know how to handle the real crisis, and they don't they they take the front row instead of like allowing a mental health person to say, "I hear what's going on, I understand. Let me come in. Let me you know." And and with a calm steady approach be able to 
guide the right thing happening. So it's exactly right. I, I love this conversation is happening. And what the real issues are, housing is such a major one. You know, you see these people that are piled on top of each other, piled on top of each other. And, you know, in one way, one thing that has come out of COVID is that a lot of the shelters, there's so many people in shelters mm -hmm. or refusing to be in shelters, so they're on the street. But during COVID times, they've actually put some of the people in shelters into hotels, empty hotels that aren't, you know, operating because of COVID and people are doing better. Why? Because they have reasonable housing. They're not sharing, you know, a, a big dorm area with, you know, 50 people. They have a room that they share with one person or they have mm -hmm. themselves. So that's- so, uh, There's a lot of empty spaces and storefronts now. What is, what else creatively is happening? Is it anything, you know, repurposing, helping people? Do you see anything on the street inspirational? Uh, you mean in terms of there's so anything. many empty yeah. storefronts, yeah. empty hotels, like you're saying, empty, empty, and then still people on the street on the street. Well, you know, I, I want to bring it all back to the arts. You know, it, the problem is everybody is talking about mental health, you know, filling in, and I couldn't agree more. But the arts is as big a, a, a place that needs to have. Um, you know, support all the communities. You know, you talk about Harlem and the Shakespeare um, program that they have that, you know, so much is being closed down. And that is where people get some real healing. And so, you know, that is a big push that I would love to see happen more. Like, you know, artists are sending out all these things, defund the police and give mental health. No, let's give the arts the money, you know, to be able to simultaneously you know, work with these populations. Well, these Sally, you and I have long talked about doing an emergency crisis, artistic, well, you, she does it for me, just so you know. She's a psychiatric social worker. When I need to be talked down off the ledge, I call Sally. <laughs> well, Annie shows up, she, yeah, she, she shows up wearing the sweatshirt. She's ready to like, you know, be back up. So that is real, and that's what we all are for each other. I mean, I'm, you know, tonight is a big night. I was feeling so crappy. I don't know why. And like to be able to tune into this and see everybody is thinking along these really critical lines and bringing cultures together and telling the stories and, you know, it's such a healing thing, you know. So collaborations, collaborations. We're not alone in our little Zoom corner. Well, listen, thanks everyone. Juju. Sally, I love you both dearly. Amy, thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, Molly, uh, Molly from City Law, why don't you pop in, or Steve or Eva, why don't you guys pop in to say goodnight? And, and Tita, thank you for sharing your story too. Yes. yes. Tita, thank you. Thank Eva, you, Tita. And with yes, Sarah. Eva, now, Eva runs all the Zoom, she makes all this work, and <laughs> Molly does all the production, she makes everything work. Where's Steve? Is he saying hello or he's being shy? Here he comes. Oh, Yay. Amanda. So Steve and uh, Molly, Eva, why don't you all say good night and thanks to everybody, really. And we thank you, of course, for making this space. Yeah, thank you. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everybody. You are city lore. And so this is really such uh, an important thing for us to be able to present to the world and offer this kind of healing situation and healing space and healing conversation. We are, the City Lure family is City Lure. And so that includes all of you. And Annie and Alvin, thank you so much for leading this beautiful conversation. Yes. This important conversation. Uh, we absolutely intend to continue it. Um, and as I said earlier this evening, our next installment will be Thursday, October 22nd. Yes. Details are forthcoming. Um, please continue to follow Annie, Alvin, Amy, and Ariel and the important work that they're doing. Um, it is critical right now. I don't want to say more than ever, but as much as ever. Um, and thank you so much for all being here. Um, we can't wait to continue this conversation on Zoom and hopefully very soon in person again, face to face with touch and with voices and faces in real time in four dimensions. Um, but in the meantime, we are very grateful uh, for this community. Thank you very much. Everybody. The best, Molly. 
And who knows? can you post, can you please post a Venmo or some way to donate to City Lore? Great. Thanks for sure making can. this happen. <laughs> And let's say hello to Steve and Amanda, the founders of City Lore. Why don't you guys say a little hello? Can you unmute yourselves? Let's see. If a Steve, can you unmute yourself? Is that too too tricky? Steve, you're muted. I don't know if I could unmute uh, him. On the other side of all this, we're mm. planning a gigantic hugathon. Yes. Okay. <laughs> we're planning a gigantic hugathon. <laughs> Great. All right, who's gonna catch? And, and all of you will be invited to that hugathon. <laughs> and Amanda, you say something too. Don't be the silent woman over there. Come on. Okay. No, I'm writing postcards every day. I was writing postcards all, all afternoon. So, All right, Amanda, catch this. You ready? Here yeah. it goes. Woo! <laughs> all right. All right, I love you all. Thank you so much. Love you. Me. Thank you. Community is so important. Thank you all. Bye-bye. <laughs> Don't forget to vote. Yes. <laughs>